It's so hot out. I was actually just waiting for Captain Sunday to open, and Eric saw him, and he's like, do you have a word? And I'm like, I've got a word, but it's just get me over there by the time the captain opens, so works out. Good morning, though, Foundry Church. Honored to be here with you this morning. As Eric said, my name is Phil. First question, when you meet someone new for the first time, do you have a, a go-to line, you know, maybe something chummy like, hey, how's it going? Back in college when I was a waiter, uh, if I were to approach a single man, I might use one of my two go-tos. My first one was, how's it going, buddy? Very, very casual and chummy. Sometimes you, th- you throw a little curveball, a little spice into it, and you might go, how's it going, guy? And, and so one day, I was just kind of going back and forth between my two go-to greetings. How's it going, buddy? How's it going, guy? And I made the cardinal mistake the egregious sin that no server should ever make. And I walked up to him, and maybe you see where this is going. I merged my two greetings. And with perfect clarity, I walked right up to the table, and I said, how's it going, Gutty? Because <laughs> there's no real coming, like, once you've called someone Gutty, it's hard to go, you know, it's hard to just have a normal encounter with, with Gutty. So I actually, from that day on, ever since I've switched up my go-to, if I meet you for the first time, usually my go-to line now is, so what's your story? And I like asking that one for a myriad of reasons. First, it's way more open-ended. You get some amazing answers. I asked a student once, once his story was, and he started with birth. And I'm like, awesome, okay, here we go. This is your story. But it's way more open-ended, and it leaves so much room for the imagination. So Foundry Church, what's your story? I mean, not your church story. What's your story? We're here this morning as the church, but what's your story? I know for myself, I've recently been discovering a lot about my own story, and it's what I would consider to be the ultimate rabbit hole. Some of you may argue and push back, and you think the interwebs have better rabbit holes, but I have found none better for time wasting than Ancestry.com. For those of you that have indulged in genealogy research and family tree, you know this is kind of like this addicting search for information. And I found out so many crazy things about my family tree and my history and my lineage. And I just had a lot of late nights nerding out on it. So I learned some good things, some bad things. Let me give you some examples. A good thing. I won't tell you how long it took me to crack this code, but I did find out on my wife's side of the family tree, my children are related to Taylor Swift. And I'm hoping to leverage that with free concert tickets with Cousin Tay-Tay, as I call her now. She doesn't know we're related, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's like 11th, 18 times removed. It's bizarre, but it's true. I can, I can prove it. I also found out, and you would, you would think what I'm about to say is a good thing, but I found out that in my family tree, the Harbison men have a rich tradition of rocking a good mustache. So I found this picture. This is my great-great-grandfather, Thomas Harbison, in rural Tennessee, rocking a sweet Tennessee mustache, right? And I knew, historically, my own grandfather, Matthew Harbison, also rocked a great mustache. Just classy. Like, that's a classy stash. My father later would go on to rock the Tom Selleck. (laughs) And so with all of this great family tradition, you would naturally assume, right, that this... The next in line would, would also be the heir to a great stash. And I tried it one day, much to my dismay, and I was like, I'm the Lorax. What? I, did I think I was indebted to a great stash? Probably. But either way, I cannot rock the stash. So that is a bad thing. Get that off the screen. Woo! I also learned that my heritage traces back to uh, County Antrim in Northern Ireland. That was kind of fascinating until I discovered that traditionally we were leprechaun hunters and known as warlike herdsmen. So uh, that's 50-50, make of it what you may. You know, when you're doing a job interview and you tell someone you're a warlike herdsman, eh, what are you going to do with that part? But the worst part of all of my genealogy research, besides, this is also true, I can't make this up, besides finding out that My wife's 12th great-grandfather is also the exact same man as my 11th great-grandfather. 1600s, it goes back to the Mayflower. We're of pilgrim ilk, but the family tree uh, definitely merges together. And so forgive me, I am related to my wife, but it's... 
400 years ago, Foundry. Come on. Just let it, let it go. But, but the truth and, and the scary part is, is that when I studied the family tree, I found so much darkness. Seriously, I found, have you heard the phrase, having a skeleton in your closet? We found skeletons, both sides of the family. And it was actually a fairly dark place where like, there's funny pictures and funny stories, but half the time you're like, ew, this, it's amazing. It's amazing that we're all here to some degree. But here's what we found. Um, it's not just skeletons in your closet. I think I would summarize it by saying this. There was some severely broken branches of this family tree. Broken branches. Addiction, bankruptcy, substance abuse, divorce, crime, deceit, infidelity, scandal, betrayal, even murder. Foundry, my family tree has more than a few broken branches. And when you start to trace these lines, you realize just how quickly and how broken so many families can be. So what's your story? Is your family tree littered with as many broken branches as my family tree is? And in this current series on the life of Joseph, we find an entry point into this story very quickly because like my dysfunctional family and probably like many of yours, you go, there is a place for us to understanding the story of God. This family, as we've been discussing the last few weeks here at the Foundry, is the toxic embodiment of jealousy, envy, and hatred. We find a family that, like mine, also has a dark history. And my prayer is for us this morning as we process this, that God might give us the courage to look at some of the our history of broken family branches, and just to have the courage to go, okay, God, what are you doing in the midst of all of this brokenness, this betrayal, and this rejection? So I want to dive into the scripture, if you're ready for that this morning, Foundry. We're going to kind of take it in a couple different chunks. The first chunk is a bigger chunk of scripture, but I believe you guys are up for that this morning. So we're going to go to Genesis 37, verses 12, 28. It'll be up on the screen if you want to follow along or if you want to flip with us in your Bibles. Genesis 37, 12 through 28. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for, he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him. They have moved on from here, but I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. Now, a few things to take note of in context. Uh, most of us, unless you're from the area, these terms of Shechem and Dothan and Hebron probably don't mean much to us, so let's try and put it in a little bit of context if we can this morning. The map's a little bit blurry, just bear with me, but the purple arrow here shows the migration of Jacob and his sons, and the dotted one is showing Joseph's journey. And so you can see, here's Hebron here, moving up to Shechem, that's about 50 miles, and then his brothers were not at Shechem, so they're another 14 miles further to the north in Dothan. You can kind of see it up there in the corner. There's Dothan. The green lines show Joseph's then journey to Egypt. But 65 miles. Now, again, I don't want us to miss the nuances of the story here, so let's put this into context. 65 miles for a 17-year-old walking through the wilderness mostly alone. What state was Joseph in mentally, physically, and emotionally when he actually catches up with his brothers? My guess is exhausted because it would be similar to doing this. You walk out these doors, you hang a right on Main, walk down to 31, hang a right on 31. Hit Grand Haven, keep on trucking, hit Muskegon, keep on walking. By the time you get almost to Pentwater, you have walked 65 miles. So again, immersing ourselves in the story, what physical condition was Joseph in when he finally caught up with his brothers? So let's pick up the narrative again in verse 18. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, probably exhausted, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we will see what becomes of his dreams. 
There's that toxic hatred bubbling over. Now, one of my fears with Scripture, especially if you were raised in the church like I was, is that maybe this story is familiar from when, back when you were in Sunday school and you're like, oh, it's a story about the brothers and they threw the kid into the well. It's really dark and I don't want us to actually just gloss over it. I want us to try and use our imaginations and immerse ourselves in the story. So let's go off to Israel quickly. This is, uh, it's underneath this monument here. There is a cistern here that scholars and historians believe it could be one of three really good possibilities for actually being Joseph's well. It may be, it may not be. That's not the point this morning. The point is to help us think about what is going on in this scene. Now, historically, this one, uh, here's the picture looking down into the cistern. We're talking about a 30-foot drop, and the width across the rim of this pit, this cistern, is probably about four feet across. So again, start to use your imagination. Start to picture the scene as it plays out. Now, the dark side of this passage puts it bluntly in verse 17. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. Try and visualize this. What's going on right now, church? What's going on in this scene? This is a cold, cunning, premeditated act of violence. This is not something spontaneous where they just saw Joseph coming over the ridgeline and they're like, ah, oh, there's Joseph. Maybe we should kill him today. This is something that had been brewing for so long that toxic hatred just needed a spark to set it off. So I want to know if Joseph came over that ridgeline, using my imagination, I'm wondering, was it the coat that sparked it? Or was it Joseph himself or was it a combination of the two? But here's what we know. Joseph's day just went from good to bad very quickly. Why was it going from good? My guess is if you've been looking for uh, your brothers for three days and you finally find them and you've been hiking 65 miles, you're probably pretty excited to see them. But here's what I want to know, Foundry. Did Joseph see it on their faces? If he actually crested that hill, could he tell from 100 yards out that something wasn't right? Were these nonverbal cues just brutal? Were like, you, like every hair on your arm stands up or you just get that sense that, that tingling, that sixth sense, you're like, something's not right here. And I imagine him coming over and, and you could almost see the brothers like spreading out, like this plan is coming to fruition. And I imagine this scene and I imagine part of the, the gut-wrenching moment is that these were his brothers and he probably wanted to emulate them. He probably wanted to be just like them. And without a, scarcely a word being said, these brothers went from, from brother to traitor just in the blink of an eye. Now think of the irony here too. What are they doing in this region in Dothan anyway? They're shepherding their sheep. What's the job of a shepherd? Protection. Protect the sheep. Keep the wolves away. And catch, catch the juxtaposition now. Catch the irony. We have a sick role reversal. The protectors have now become the predators. And I imagine them kind of spreading out, maybe making this, this tight circle, this formation around Joseph. Maybe they surrounded him. And again, in that physical state that Joseph was in, this isn't a fair fight. This is one on 10 with a kid who's exhausted. And I imagine Joseph quickly succumbs in a dusty fog of fists and pent up fury. Pinned to the dirt, he probably gave a little bit of a whimper, but there wasn't much to do. I imagine he was probably hogtied at this point and then thrown down in here probably hogtied if you didn't have a rope to lower someone in, that fall could kill him just in itself. But I imagine his ribs acting like shock absorbers as his bruised and bloodied body just lands with a thud in the bottom of this cistern. Heavy. Clearing the rim of the pit, he's probably just down there just in shock, bruised, bloodied, and scripture actually gives us the clue as to what happens next. And and this is the brother's memory of this event. I'm going to fast forward to Genesis chapter 42. And while it's only a few pages away from Genesis 37, this is the brother's memory of this event years later. Like, they still had a dark memory of that day at the cistern. And here's what they remember years later. Again, we're pulling this from Genesis 42. Speaking among themselves, they said, clearly we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. Here's four words I want you to hang on to. We saw his anguish. 
We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why we're in this trouble. We saw his anguish. In other words, what is scripture saying? Saying Joseph wasn't going to die quietly. Begging and pleading. It's a scene of wild desperation and of heartache. It's a teenage boy who, like a wounded animal, is not going to die quietly. So let's hit pause. What's the story at this moment, Foundry? What's Joseph's story? If you had to describe his life story up to this point, right now, what is his story? All-consuming pain, wild rage, broken desperation, crushed confusion, or E, all of the above. What is his story at this moment? If I were in that, I'll tell you what, it's insatiable revenge. That's what's brewing in me. That's the dark side of me that would be going, that's, that's, that's how I'm going to respond in this story. But here's the point. Nothing's ever going to go back to normal. They're not going to be around the Thanksgiving table cracking jokes and be like, Joseph would be like, oh, man, that was hilarious, man. When you guys threw me in the pit, remember that? That was crazy. I almost died. Like, there's no going back to normal. This is his story now. This is his reality. There is no coming back from this. And I think the scene actually gets a little bit darker, if you can believe that. Verse 25, then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. T for time out. What are they doing? He's in the pit. He's pleading. They said it themselves. We saw his anguish, and they are sitting down to have lunch. That's pretty twisted, right? That's pretty dark. When someone's begging and pleading for their life, and you can go on with your normal activities and just have lunch, Picking it up in 26, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to these Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites who were Midianite traders came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. We'll hit pause again. Things now go from bad to to worse, from the pit to the slave trade. Foundry Church, in your opinion, which scenario is worse? Is it being murder attempt on your life by those you thought you could trust, by your brothers, by family, rejection by family? Or is it slavery, sold into a land where you neither know the language or the customs and know nobody? Which scenario is worse? I think most of us may answer how I would. I would say clearly the more egregious one now is being betrayed by family. And that leads us up to our first point. Oh, side note. One of the interesting contexts, again, that's why I put the Old Testament map on, if he was sold from the north in Dothan and, and that route that these caravan, this caravan took went down to the south, down to Egypt, he probably passed Hebron, which means he could have passed his family settlement and all of these familiar landmarks that he knew from his childhood. And again, think about, again, when you immerse yourself in the story, think about the irony is now he's sold as a slave and he's passing his family settlement. He's passing familiar places to him. But our first takeaway, you might accuse me of having a keen sense of the obvious, but that's this, the pain of the pit is a deep pain. It is a deep pain. And I feel like too much, we, too, it, it's far too easy for us to gloss over the emotional honesty that scripture is giving us here. Scripture is very brutally emotionally honest with us. This is a story redefining deep pain. It might be an all-consuming, soul-anguishing type of pain, if we are honest. And can we also admit, church, that this may hit too close to home for many of us? Because here's the thing, here's the rub. For someone to betray you, what has to happen in this equation? Proximity has to be involved. Someone can't betray you if they are not close to you. For someone to betray you, there has to be a proximity and a closeness involved. Pastor Eugene Peterson, in his message paraphrase of the scriptures, this is how he translated Psalm 34, verse 18. If your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. If you're kicked in the gut or stabbed in the back, you sense that proximity at work here in this betrayal. 
And far too many of us know exactly what he means. You know what it means to have the wind knocked out of you. You know what it means to be stabbed in the back. Wounded, betrayed, life-altering, story-redefining, dark, dank pit. So many of God's people are so familiar with these pits. Social workers will tell you that it bears itself out in a myriad of ways, that betrayal by proximity. Here's a very scary statistic to me. One study found that between 85 and 90% of child abuse and sexual assault is from someone you know. 85 to 90% by someone you know. And that's what's so crushing about the pit. It's broken trust by someone who is supposed to be trustworthy. And this is happening all over with families and with coworkers and with churches. And I want to take a little bit of a risk and just step out because I know that in a room this size, there are people here this morning who have been wounded either by a church or by someone who claims to be a Christ follower. And I'm also positive that there are people who are not in this room, and in fact, they're not in any church in West Michigan because they've been wounded by a church or by a Christ follower. And they've said, I'll never go back. I'll never set foot in that place again. And I started to go through, I was making a mental checklist, and I was numbering off people who I knew had said, I'll never go set foot in a church ever again. And I stopped counting after I used all 10 fingers. Haunting, like, what, what is going on? Even as churches, we know this pain of betrayal. And I just want to take a second and say, if that's you, I do want to offer up my apologies. Maybe it's too little too late. Maybe it's, it comes across as trite, but my heart breaks because the church has this strange tendency of devouring its own, and I hate that. I hate how the church seems to destroy its own family. And my heart breaks. And if you're in that position, I just would offer it up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry on behalf of so many churches and ministry leaders that, that we've wounded our own. I want to illustrate this with another example. Um, there's a woman. Her name's Christine Kane. She's a teacher. She's a speaker. She's a best-selling author. She's written a handful of books recently. But she's also the founder of an organization called A21. She is a powerhouse of a woman. Like, they're rescuing women from sex slavery and this woman needs a cape. They've got uh, 12 offices in 11 different countries, and they're doing amazing work. And I just so admire her courage, her boldness, her leadership. But here's what she said about betrayal. Like, again, she's doing amazing work, right? And I came across this quote, and I'm like, oh, I have to share this. This is the perfect summary. Here's what Christine Kane said. The only thing that realistically came close to taking me out, like literally, where I wanted to give up was this personal betrayal, way more than cancer. When it happens with people in your inner circle that you're either doing ministry with or life with, when you go, I just did not expect that. It so deeply wounded me that I went to counseling for two hours a week for six months because I didn't even know how to process this. She's running multi-million dollar organizations that are doing amazing work preventing modern day trafficking, modern day slavery, and yet what was it that was going to take her out at the knees? It was betrayal. By who? Inner circle. That's how powerful, that's how deep this pain can be. And I'm sure Joseph would say he didn't even know how to process this either that pain of that cistern would forever be a part of Joseph's life, would it not? How many times did Joseph go by a well and he just shuddered? Just shuddered, the, like all of those, like a PTSD flashback of just like not even getting water today. I can't even, can't even go there. How many of us resonate with Joseph as the walking wounded? Don't put your hands up. I, I mean, it's a rhetorical question, but it's not. I think so many of us do. We know life in the pit. How many of us would say that that is my story right now? That pit, Phil, that is my story presently. Or if it was, if it's not presently, how many of you would say that used to be my story? And the story of God doesn't minimize the pain. Foundry, catch this. For far too long, there's been this fraudulent version of Christianity that says you only approach God when you've got it pulled together, when you're out of the pit. And that's a bold-faced lie. You approach God from the pit you approach God from that place of rejection and betrayal. 
We can be emotionally real enough to let God know what he already knows and that we are broken and that we are hurting. And that invitation is open to come as you are. After all, Joseph was sold for what? 20 pieces of silver? Jesus was sold for 30 pieces. Think he can relate? Now, back to the story. I said we're going to kind of take this in chunks. So I want to wrap up this narrative and then draw one more conclusion out of it if I can in our time together. Picking up chapter 37, verse 29. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. One brother, one brother was going to stand up. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, the boy is gone. What will I do now? Hang on to that question. I want to circle around to that. Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. That's an outward sign of just deep mourning. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. Goes on to finish like this. I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he would say, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was the captain of the palace guard. Now, We'll hit pause again. Imagine if Genesis ends here. There's actually 13 more chapters. It doesn't. But imagine it does. What's the overwhelming narrative if it ends here? It's pretty dark. It's like that horrible moment when you're watching Avengers Infinity War and you realize with 10 minutes left to go that there's a sequel coming and you have unresolved tension now for 12 months until the next film comes out and you hate that moment because you want to know how the story ends. But you can't. So there would be this tension in the story if it ended here. We hate that unresolved feeling, don't we? And there is a natural gap in this story because here's what we know. Joseph was in Egypt long enough to do what? Learn the language, a couple years, take a wife, learn the customs, uh, and, well, there's a trilogy here. We're not going to do all the spoilers today. We'll save that. Come back this summer. You'll find out. But if it ends here, what's the story? Don't you think it's a story of asking why? Like, when there's rejection, brokenness, and betrayal of this magnitude, isn't that inherently the first thing on our lips is to go, why? Why, God? What would Joseph be questioning? Why him? Why did he have to have these dreams in the first place? Why was it family that betrayed him? Why now? What did he do to deserve such a fate? What about Reuben, the oldest brother? What questions might Reuben have been asking? As the oldest brother, it would have been Reuben's job to watch over Joseph. And he's already wondering what to do next. He's racked with guilt about not acting sooner. What would Reuben have been questioning? Why didn't I act up sooner? Why, why didn't I, I fix this when I could have? Why did I trust them that they'd leave him in the well so he could work his rescue plan? What can I do now to redeem this? Can this even be redeemed? Will this family ever be family again? What about the patriarch Jacob? You think he has questions? He's probably wondering why his son, in his mind, had to die a terrible death. Wondering why God abandoned him. Asking why he sent Joseph to them in the first place. He's wondering about what the point of living is. That's how broken he is. That's how many questions have been unanswered. Takeaway number two, Foundry. One, The pain of the pit is real and it's a deep, deep pain. Takeaway number two, the why questions often go unanswered. The why questions often go unanswered and I think you and I can probably relate to that. Have you ever asked God why when there's brokenness and rejection and betrayal? Why me? Why this? Why now? Why is he permitting this? And in this passage, we don't find clarity. We don't find simple solutions or quick answers or cliches. Here's what we find. It's not a silver lining right up first. What do we see, though? If the story ends here, what do we see with these unanswered questions? We see Joseph dragged away as a slave. We see the cynical Reuben 
spiraling into questions of guilt and shame. We see Jacob restless, uncomforted, wondering what the point of living is. Foundry, can I dare to suggest to you that if you don't know where God is or what God is doing, that you may be an excellent company? Yes, we want, the, we want to know how the story ends. But we have to live in this tension as believers as it's the not yet tension. We are not able yet to comprehend and we may not be ever on this side of eternity. We may never have the answers that we feel like we deserve. And so we're stuck with the mysterious and it seems way too deep and too dark and too complex to ever begin to process like Christine Kane said. And so today our story ends right here. And yeah, I'll admit it, it's not your typical Sunday sermon. What did we learn? Yep, the pain is deep and God's silence seems deafening. Great talk, Phil, great talk. Go in peace. <laughs> but I think the challenge, Foundry, is to live in this tension and the unanswered whys, and it's, the challenge is to ask the right questions. Because all morning along, I've been trying to circle us back to saying, what's your story? What's your story? And I think we have to start asking the who question. Because what's your story is a halfway decent question, but isn't it also safe to say that whose story is it may get us to the crux of the matter a little faster? Not what's your story, whose story is it? That's the direction we need to leave going. In Psalm 103, David, beautiful psalm, he puts it rather bluntly in verses 2 through 4. Just listen as I read this. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all of your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Emphasis on the who. Who what? Who? Who is writing this story? The story doesn't end here because we know who is writing the narrative. David says the who matters because the who is the God who can redeem your life from where? from the pit. The invitation foundry, I want to close with this. The invitation is to trust the who. And this invitation to trust the who has to trump the, in, the reason to know the why. We're so desperate to know the why, but I think we have to lean way more into the who than the why. This is a foundational truth of Christianity. We claim to know the author and the perfecter of our faith. Phil translation, we know who's writing the story, right? We know who's writing the story. And it doesn't make it any easier, believe me. But in the end, this is not a formulaic process. We want it to be more like math, where it's step one, two, and three, and we'll figure out what's going on. And it's way more like art. This is messy redemption at work. This is God's masterpiece, and we don't know what he's doing with this canvas. and We can't tell what's going on, but he can. And so this part of the story ends with very little resolution. To be honest, I, I'm starting to be okay with that. As much as I hate that tension of things being unresolved, I'm starting to get it. Honestly, as, as Eric said, uh, we used to do youth ministry together. I'm not in youth ministry. I'm not in any ministry right now. I drive semi-trucks to Chicago five days a week. I feel like I've gone through this five-year period of asking, where is God? What are you up to? To make a long story very short, I was trying to wrestle with, okay, God, was my plan for, I was trying to live in obedience. Was this, was this plan like your will, but not your timing? Was it your timing and your will? but those around me didn't get it? Was it not your will and not your timing and I missed everything? And I understand me trying to discern God's will it may pale in comparison to the pit that you are either in or maybe you've been in. But my simple prayer for you, Foundry, this morning is this, as the band comes up and as we get ready to wrap up. My prayer for you, Foundry, is that you would be a people that still believe that the author of the story may yet have something to add to this story. I don't believe it's written. I don't believe the book is closed. So what's your story? What's my story? I hope and I pray, Foundry, that they are interwoven with Christ's epic masterpiece, the only story out there that seems to hold on to hope. Let's pray. 
God in heaven, we confess that many of us know the pit too well. We confess that it's a dark pain and that we need you. We're so thankful, Father, that we have a theology of the pit that says that we don't have to come to you once we're out of the pit. We come to you from right where we're at. We thank you for that invitation that while we were yet sinners, you came for us. While we were yet in pits, you came for us. We thank you that you claim to be the author and perfecter, and so we put our hope and our faith in you to continue to write this story as you said that you will be faithful to do just that. And so we lean in to your promise to be the author and to be the perfecter of this faith that we cling to from our pits. So write this story. Write it in that epic masterpiece that you so often just blow our minds with as we just hold on to you today. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, Foundry Church, before we send you back into the sauna, a blessing over you this morning. Circle back to Psalm 103 of David. And I'll just lean into this as a blessing for you this morning. May you, Foundry Church, praise the Lord, forgetting not all of his benefits, remembering the who who forgives all of your sins, remembering the who who heals all of your diseases, remembering he who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Go now in that love and that compassion. Have a great week and happy Father's Day. Amen.